I'm Renee Williams. And I'm Billy Thomas. And welcome to another edition of From the Woods Today. You know, there's a lot of things, Billy, that make up a tree and what a tree is and how many trees there are. And I mean, it just keeps going on and on and on. So today you're actually going to tell us what is a tree? I know it's it seems like such a simple question, right? What is a tree? But, you know, how do we know a tree is not a fern? Right. How do we know a tree is not a squirrel? Right. I mean, <laughs> all, it might sound simple, but there are some ways that we can kind of tell these different trees. We'll talk about that here in a minute. We also have Laurie Thomas is going to be on talking about how you can identify those trees. So I'm going to try to paint the picture of what trees are and kind of that whole universe of trees as they exist here on Earth. And then Laurie's going to try to help us figure out which tree is which. Um, so it should be a really great show. We appreciate y'all being with us. If you have questions and you're on Zoom with us, please use the chat function and we will try to interact with you there but i'm excited to have you all with us um, today to learn about trees and how to identify them exactly so okay let's go ahead and get started and you know billy is our first host um so he's going to be actually talking about what is a tree so right. billy, answer that question for us <laughs> all right then we'll have to work our way through it a little bit okay so here all we right. go all right, so what is a tree? Great question, right? It really is. And you can think about it in a lot of different ways, um, but we're gonna try to help you narrow down to figure out what these plants are that we're looking at, how one is a tree and how one is not a tree. Um, so we'll kind of work our way through that. Um, thank you all again for being with us as we try to discover what is a tree. All right. First thing I'll tell you is trees are the answer, right? Um, that's a common phrase we often use in forestry that trees are the answer. And really what we mean is regardless of kind of the issue or the challenge, we always think that we can kind of make trees the answer. You know, you think about wood products and we have thousands, literally thousands of different wood products out there that come from trees. Not all of them are wood. There's a lot of byproducts, a lot of chemicals that come from trees that we that find their ways um, into our uses every day. What about wildlife? You know, trees provide habitat for wildlife, um, which is a really important thing as this owl would attest to. What about clean water? They play an important role in cleaning our water. The trees along the stream sides help stabilize the soil. They also um, act as buffer kind of strips before pollutants can reach the water. So they play an important role there. What about the air they help clean? You know, they take in carbon dioxide and through photosynthesis, they're able to release oxygen and help clean our air. Um, so that's a really important attribute as well. They also provide an important place for recreation to occur. You know, here in Kentucky, about half the state is covered in forest land with most of that privately held and much um, recreation happens on there, whether that's mountain biking or hiking or bird watching or hunting or fishing or whatever. Trees are an important part of recreation for sure. They also can be an important food source, not only for wildlife, but also for people as well, um, as we see in these plums here. Bottom line is there's a lot of trees in the world. We have over 60,000 tree species that have been identified in the world. That's a lot, a whole lot. And we don't have that many here in the United States or that many in Kentucky, but we still have quite a few. And trying to understand or distinguish one tree from a different it can be challenging. And, and we'll learn more about that as we go through. Okay, before we get into kind of breaking down trees, let's talk a little bit about how we go about studying plants in general, and that's botany. Botany is the science of study of plants. So we were trying to understand everything about plants, how they function, how they grow, um, how they keep going, um, going forward and keep surviving. And then that might beg a question, well, what is a plant in the first place, right? And there are a few common characteristics I think we could all agree on or you might think of when you start thinking about plants, right? One of the common ones is they often have green, um, and that's from that chlorophyll that's inside them, and that is the... the the, the molecules that allow us to get photosynthesis to take place, which is really, really important um, from a food production standpoint. You think about the ability to take sunlight energy, um, a little carbon dioxide, um, and, 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 and a few other little things, and then be able to create sugars out of that that can not only feed trees, but feed people as well. So it's pretty impressive that trees are able to do that. We also think about plants being immobile, right? They're not, they're not running around. Uh, most of them, or at least the ones we think of, are rooted in the ground. Of course, you could have them in pots and other things. But generally, when we're talking about plants, they are attached to the earth, more or less. And the other thing we think about 
plants in general is that they do not have a nervous system or an excretory system. So they don't have any ability um, to kind of do some of those things um, internally like our bodies can, how they can communicate, how we can get rid of waste. Um, trees don't have the, and trees or plants in general don't have that ability. Um, so they're kind of unique in that. Another unique thing about plants in general is that their cell walls are compo composed largely of cellulose. And that's an important attribute that we take advantage of um, as humans all the time. We use cellulose for a lot of different things, but it's an important thing that helps give trees and plants um, some of their structure as well. So really important. And then when we think about woody plants amongst this whole universe of plants that exist, these are what we're talking about here are plants that are more perennial. That means they live, you know, year after year. They keep growing year after year and they produce wood as part of their structural tissue and then in, in trees and we'll talk a little bit more about that um, how that works um, it, but it also holds true that woody material holds true for um, shrubs as well as um, lanaise or vines out there as well so um, woody plants are just one segment of plants overall so all right so you kind of understand what plants are now we understand maybe what woody plants are so let's dig a little bit deeper and let's think about trees and we're going to talk Talk about dendrology. Um, dendrology is the study of trees. So if botany is the study of plants overall, we've narrowed down our focus a little bit to focus on trees, and that's where we call dendrology. And um, I had the privilege of being able to um, be a teacher's assistant for a couple of years here at the University of Kentucky in our dendrology class. So I had the pleasure of teaching undergraduate students the diversity of trees here in Kentucky. And um, I tell you, it's kind of addictive. Once you start understanding and identifying the different trees that are out there, you want to know them all. So um, be careful. And um, once you go, get going down this path, you'll want to know every tree that's out there. All right, so let's break down those woody plants a little bit more. So trees are the, are the focus of today's, but there are other woody plants out there. Um, but the trees, typically what we're talking about is a single main stem, mostly, right? Always exceptions, but it gets at least 20 feet tall. So again, you can find some exceptions to this, but generally that's what we're talking about. And then when we think about other woody plants, shrubs are a common one. And um, these are gonna be smaller, typically less than 20 feet. And they'll often have multiple stems that come from the, um, ground. So I'm um, not a single stem like we see in a tree often. And then you have vines or Linnaeus. Um, right here in the lower right, we have um, some uh, poison ivy. It is a vine or Linnaea. And these two are perennial woody um, materials. Um, and they use trees or other structures to kind of grow up and reach the sunlight. So while they may not form a single stem or like a shrub or a bush, they basically can climb on other things um, by sending out tendrils that can grab on and allow them to grow up and find sunlight. So, all right, so now we've talked about what plants are. Now we've broken down the different woody plants. Now we're gonna keep digging a little bit deeper. Um, but before we go too deep, I feel like it's time to take a quick little interlude and mention somebody back from the the 1700s. Um, some of you all may be familiar with this gentleman, Carl Linnaeus. He was a pretty um, important person when it comes to understanding how things are classified, how the natural world is classified. Um, Carl um, is known as the father of modern taxonomy, and taxonomy is really the system of classification, how we classify um, one plant from another, one animal from another, um, and, and on down the line. He was a Swedish botanist, a zoologist, taxonomist, physician, and really he came up with the system that we, we still use today albeit it has changed over time, um, but we still use this kind of system to name trees. Um, an example I'm showing you here is Liriodendron tulipifera. That is the scientific name. The genus is Liriodendron, and tulipifera is the species name for our tree, the yellow poplar, right? Um, so why would we use Latin to identify trees? Well, one of the great things about Latin is, is that it's pretty much a dead language, right? It's not changing. It's not evolving. Um, you look at our English language who gets new entries every year of new words that are being invented and created. You don't see that happening in Latin. So by putting some of those names or those names in Latin, we can kind of lock them down. And that becomes really important if we're trying to talk about the same tree. 
um, perhaps you live in different parts of the country. And um, one example I, I like to always point out to is the yellow poplar. This is a state tree of Kentucky. It's also the state tree of Tennessee and the state tree of Indiana, just to show how important it is in this region. But if you look at the different common names that you can find for that tree, um, there's quite a few of them, right? Tulip tree, American tulip tree, tulip wood, um, tulip, um, tulip poplar, white wood, fiddle tree, and yellow hyphen poplar, which is the really official common name. So by using the Latin, we're able to all agree on what species we're talking about, whereas we might have a lot of confusion if we were just using local common names. So um, a big hat tip to Linnaeus, not only for that, but so for organizing so much, so much of our natural world so that we can then study it and communicate it about it um, across the planet. It's really, really impressive. Um, all right, so let's talk a little bit more about breaking our woody plants down. And specifically, we're thinking about trees now. And when we talk about trees, we basically have two different groups that we're going to break them down into. The first group we're going to talk about are gymnosperms. And these have naked seeds or exposed seeds, like you would find in pine cones, right? That's the kind of the examples that often people think of um, our pine trees uh, more or less are in this gymnosperm group. And there's not as many of those. There's only 12 families with roughly 700 species in the world. And those really started uh, developing more than 319 million years ago, right? That's a long time ago, as you can see here on this chart of how basically plants kept moving up. So we went from algae um, to little mosses, and then we kept growing and growing into ferns and other things until we finally get to these flowering plants and these angiosperms. And these didn't appear until about 134 million years ago. And that's a much bigger group, right? And the, what we're talking about when we're talking about these, these seeds basically develop in the ovaries of the flowers um, of these uh, flowering plants. And they basically put a protective coat around those seeds. And often that protective coat happens to be a food source that animals and others can then be attracted to and help spread that seed around. If we think about angiosperms, we're talking about every flowering plant on the planet. And that's a lot, right? We're talking over 400 different families and over 300,000 individual species that are grouped under this flowering plant category. So um, there's a lot out there. Now, not all of those are trees, um, but there are quite a few. So looking further at kind of how we break down plants, right? So we, we break plants and all other organisms down into a, into basically classification systems. And for plants, we talk about the plant kingdom. If we were talking about animals, we would be talking about the animal kingdom. Um, so those are basically the, that one of the first higher orders that we start breaking it down. And then you get, you start coming down a little bit further and we're looking at vascular plants over here. And this vascular plants basically means that these are plants that have the ability to transport and move fluids right up and down within their structure right that was a, a big uh, um, evolution from these non-vascular plants and our trees are part of this vascular plant group right and so you can see here we've got two groups that are circled here we've got our conifers that are part of that vascular plants and then over on the right are more of the kind of the broadleaf or angiosperms that we're going to be talking about um, when we talk about kind of the flowering version. So uh, let's break that down a little bit further. So here's two examples of two common trees that we have here in Kentucky. Um, on the left, you'll see the um, white pine, the eastern white pine. You'll notice there's a few different common names for that there. And you'll notice at the very bottom that we have Pinaceae. That is the family um, of pine trees. And then we have Pinus and we have strobus there, right? So pinus refers to the genus that we're dealing with, um, just a lower classification under family. And then the species is a further classification of the pinus group, right? So now we're talking about one specific one, the white pine, strobus. And then on the right, you can see a similar kind of breakdown from that classification. So what we've done is we're basically group plants by similar characteristics. Um, so uh, yellow poplar is part of the Magnoliaceae family, and the genus for my, um, for yellow poplar is Liriodendron, while the species is Tulipifera. And then a big shout out to Linnaeus again. If you'll notice this little L at the end of Liriodendron, Tulipifera at the bottom, and the L at the bottom of Pinostrobus, and that's a hat tip to Linnaeus for identifying and naming those trees. So you'll see sometimes different initials or names or abbreviations after a sign 
scientific name and what those represent or who is credited with naming that tree. So if you see that L, you're, you know you're dealing with Linnaeus, so, which is pretty cool. And many, many of our trees have Linnaeus as listed there. All right, so let's talk about genosperms and angiosperms here in Kentucky, right? We're typically, um, we're, we're talking about needles or needles-like or scale-like, and we have quite a few um, of these, not as many as angiosperms, but there are um, three different families, I think about eight different species that we have here in Kentucky that are, are considered gymnosperms. So when it comes comes time to learn your trees, um, starting with your pines or your gymnosperms is an easy way to have some great success. Um, so that's an easy one. But, you know, they're not a big part of the forest of Kentucky or the trees that we have in Kentucky. They actually make up a rather small percentage of all of our trees. With most of our trees are considered broadleaf um, in that angiosperms category. And that means they have flowers. And typically ours are deciduous, means they lose their leaves in the fall, right? And that's important. Um, the kind of a uh, characteristic that we can use. And about 90% or more of the trees here in Kentucky are under this category. And we're talking about 24 different families being represented here in Kentucky um, under this broadleaf or angiosperm. So a lot more diversity. So when it comes to uh, identifying your trees in this group, it gets a little more challenging just because you're dealing with a lot more diversity. Um, than you are with that other one. And, you know, when we think about all the native trees here that we have in Kentucky, we're looking at around 120 native species of trees. That's quite a few if you think about it. Um, so let's go ahead and break down kind of what is a tree a little bit further, kind of break it into its constituent parts, if you will. A tree, again, we talked about this, it's a woody plant and typically 20 feet tall has a single stem is kind of, you know, our, our broad category that we're going to consider a tree. But there are different parts of the tree that we can think about as well. We think about the top part where the branches are that have the leaves or needles, that is considered the crown of the tree. And looking at the crown is a great way to get a good indication of what that what's underground as well in the roots, right? If that crown is nice and healthy and full, and, and robust and vigorous, then we know that probably the roots underground are in good shape as well. Um, the trunk is that main stem or support. And then when it comes from a wood product, a lot of the, at least the, the solid wood that we use really comes from that bottom 16 or so feet of the tree. We get a lot of other products from the rest of it, but um, the whole tree can be used for a wide variety of products. Um, so let's take a little deeper dive into the tree. So this is a diagram of what the, if you took a cross section of a tree, um, that woody stem in the middle there, uh, the trunk, and then you broke it down. And then what you'll see is there's various parts and they all perform different functions. On the outside, we have the bark and this is the protective layer, right? This keeps stuff that is not tree from being inside of the tree, right? So it's that shield, that barrier, that defensive mechanism um, that keeps stuff out of the tree, which is really an important role. And then we think about the phloem. That's that next area inside the bark. And this is what really helps transport the food down. So if you can imagine, you have all the leaves up there collecting the sunlight, photosynthesizing, making sugars, right? And then they have to get that sugar down to the rest of the tree. So that comes and it makes its way down that phloem and it gets um, kind of spread out throughout that tree wherever the tree needs it. A lot of it, lot of it does get ended up stored in the roots, which allows it to kind of store those for long term storage. And then just inside of that phloem, we have a very, very special kind of um, a, a, a cell type. And this is our cambium, right? This is meristematic tissue. This is tissue that can kind of keep growing and dividing forever, right? It's really unique tissue. And what, what the way it grows is it basically grows and, and stuff on the inside of the tree of that cambium layer becomes xylem. It becomes that new xylem, which is the sapwood. And then on the outside, it becomes the phloem or that conductive tissue. So it keeps reproducing over and over throughout the life of that tree, which is really kind of a magical thing in many ways. And, and eventually, you know, you'll end up with that heartwood or that, that, that the, the solid xylem there. And that really provides not only some transport for waters and nutrients, but that really is where a lot of the structural support for the tree occurs. It's also a great place for the tree to park some of those maybe chemicals or molecules that are problematic. It can kind of store those away um, inside its heartwood so that they can't cause harm or problems to the tree.
And, you know, so the, again, the heart would provide that support. So let's think a little bit, and I mentioned this, that meristem or meristematic growth, right? That, again, that's really an, a critical piece of kind of trees in particular, right? That's that part that keeps dividing. And trees grow in really two ways, right? They grow longer and they grow wider. So we have meristematic tissue at the very ends, uh, all the buds, they contain that. The root tips also contain that meristematic tissue as well as the cambium. So uh, the bud and the um, root tips, that allows the tree and the roots to grow longer and taller. Whereas that cambium meristematic tissue allows the tree to grow wider. Um, so those are kind of the growth zones for trees. They grow longer, um, both from tips as well as the roots, but also they can get wider because of that. Um, pretty interesting. So let's talk just briefly about how trees regenerate, right? Um, you know, how do trees get where they are and they get established, right? There's a few different ways. When we talk about natural product reproduction, basically a tree grows, it produces seed, that seed falls on the ground, that seed then sprouts and becomes a new tree, right? That's a common way that many of us think about it. But there are other ways that trees can regenerate. And one of the most common ones that we use often as a management tool here in Kentucky is through sprouting. And we can cut trees in different ways. And depending on the vigor of that tree, we can expect different types of sprouting responses. And we know certain species are more, um, have more aptitude to sprout certain ways than others. So this allows us to take advantage of that regeneration when we're trying to regrow a woodland um, out there, right? We know how to kind of use this in a way to get good trees established. And what you're doing when you do um, this sprouting or using the sprouting, think about that root system that existed underground. Now you're putting a small little tree on top of that and it has a huge root system. So it's gonna be able to grow exceptionally fast. Whereas if you put a small little tree out there, like this little acorn on the left, it's just starting, it doesn't have much of a root system. So it's not going to have much of an advantage. So when it comes to advantage for, I guess, the speed of occupying that site, we're going to have way more success with sprouting. Again, we're just dealing with big root systems that allow that to happen. And there's other ways that we can get trees to grow. Artificial regeneration is another one of those important ways to get trees to grow. And we do this when maybe there's an area where we don't have the species that we want, or we don't have any trees at all in an area. We can then take trees and plant them, whether we plant seeds or little saplings or larger bald and burlap trees, we can move them there. We can also do breeding of trees to get certain attributes. And, you know, one example that's coming to mind right now is the American chestnut. It's been going through a long-term breeding program to try to breed in some resistance to the fungus that causes the chestnut blight. And most recently, they've been able to um, tap into a wheat gene that uh, uh, prevents that fungus from growing. So there's some efforts to try to um, put some of these wheat genes um, into American chestnut, and those are actually being tested right now with the hope that that will allow the American chestnut to survive. So that's a little overview of uh, basically about trees, how we classify them, how we break them down, and then how they reoccupy sites. So I thought it'd be nice to close on a few nice scenic shots of trees of North America, specifically trees trees the United States. And I'm going to give you the first a little um, link here is a tree. If you're curious about this, the um, Department of Interior has a nice little um, a, a site right here that I've got linked here on the front page. It's got really some amazing pictures of really unique kind of trees across the United States. So this first one you're looking at is mangrove swamp. Um, down in Florida. And, you know, these trees, believe it or not, they're able to kind of grow and regenerate in these um, salty environments. And they play such a vital and role, um, not only from a wildlife, um, from a food and nesting standpoint, think of birds, um, but also they're kind of serve as a buffer from storms as they come in to the mainland. So just one, one really cool group of trees on um, the mangrove forest down there around Florida. And then we jump over to California and we start thinking about the coastal redwoods and you see these majestic large trees and, you know, it really kind of gives you a sense of reverence like, wow, these are massive, massive trees, right? And they've been here for a very long time. And these trees are, are really, really cool and they're really protected. And um, there's not as many of these left as there used to be. Um, so if you're ever out in California, make sure to stop by and see some of these amazing um, coast redwood trees.
And then we think about um, maybe the bristlecone pine. This is a, a Nevada. This bristlecone pine is a tree that really can live a very, very, very long time. Um, it is considered one of the longest living trees or of the ability to live one of the longest. Um, we're talking in the thousands of years, these trees are able to withstand these very harsh environments, very low moisture environments, but still they persist, right? Pretty cool. But for me, there's no greater trees than we have here in Kentucky. And if you think about the beautiful trees that we have here in this state, more than 120 different native tree species, and you see it each fall, those trees take on a, a vibrant colors as they yield their fall colors. And these trees do so much for each of us. So um, thank you all for learning what is a tree. And I hope you too will try to get out there and identify some of these beautiful trees that we have. Thank you, Billy. We greatly appreciate you uh, doing that presentation to kind of get us lined up to even figure out what a tree is before you know, Lori comes on and tries to tell us how to identify. <laughs> how to identify them now. I know. <laughs> well, so much to think about. There really is. I know. 120. Wow. <laughs> yeah. So it's like we have 120 just in Kentucky, and that's a diverse amount of trees. And but you can narrow it down for us a little bit to let us know how to kind of get it to a certain point, correct? Absolutely. And that's what we're going to go through today. Um, I've got a, a short uh, PowerPoint talking about identifying the trees of Kentucky or anywhere, actually, and learning how to use a really handy, inexpensive little tool um, in order to uh, to identify all of our trees. Like Billy said, we have more than 120 different species here. So identification can be tricky. So any tool you have that makes it easier, the better off you are. So, Are right. there other states that have a whole lot more? Um, well, according to the Kentucky Division of Forestry, Florida is the most diverse and they list Kentucky as like the second most diverse. Wow. Okay. And, and if you think about it, it kind of makes sense. We're a very east to west long state. We go all the way to the Mississippi River. So we got a very different habitat type there up into the Appalachian Mountains. So lots of different topography, different soils, different places for different types of trees to grow. So, and we're kind of in the middle of the, between the north and the south too. So it's like- just kind of smack dab in the middle. <laughs> exactly, oh, exactly. Yeah. So yeah, it, it's, um, uh, it's yeah, it's beautiful. As Billy says, there's nothing like our forest. And I notice I see Willie put in their mixed metaphysics, mixed mesophytic for the win. Yes, that's right. <laughs> Love it. All right. Well, looking forward to your presentation on how you identify these hundred oh, trees. All right. Yeah, well, let me go, I'll go ahead and share this. So we are going to go through quickly how to identify trees. Um, and we're going to start with looking at the first way any way you identify anything you know when you're looking at flowers when you're looking at um, reptiles um, amphibians and insect you're going to look at the different characteristics of whatever that organism is and obviously trees are no different and when we look at walk up to a tree usually from a distance and as you walk up closer one of the first things you see are the leaves because you can see that from a distance um, but we get close and we're going to see twigs and buds flowers, especially in the spring, and we're starting to see some that are already starting to flower, um, fruit as we go into the growing season, and then bark. And a lot of times bark, people love bark because there are some trees we have out there that are very, have very unique bark. Um, and But bark can be tricky because it does tend to change with a tree's life, not on all species, but on many species. It may look one way when that tree is small and young, and as it grows, that bark's going to maybe even change colors, break up into furrows, so it'll look a little bit different. Um, but this is a great example. I'm sure everybody knows that is an American sycamore. It's a great tree to identify by bark. If you're out in the landscape and you see those white branches up in the canopy, you know that's an American sycamore. You don't need to see the leaves, the fruit, or anything else. So it's a good one to do by bark, but a lot of the rest of them aren't. So today we're going to focus on leaves and they're just about, they're going to start coming out soon. So we'll be able to um, start tackling some identif identification here soon. But a, a real quick, just note a warning. When you're looking at leaves, you want to make sure when you're standing in front of that tree that you look at more than one leaf. Don't just pick up one and go, oh yeah, that's what this is. Because leaves don't always look the same, um, even of the same species and on the same trees. You can see we've got 
three black oak leaves here, um, very broad, um, even kind of thin looking. I mean, it almost looks like it, yeah, it doesn't even look like these other two. This one's got much deeper um, sinuses and more pointy lobes. And then this one actually almost looks evergreen. Um, so you wanna make sure you look at several different examples on your tree. And this is also very true when we're looking at our conifers, our trees with needle-like leaves. So the first thing when you're looking at a tree, you walk up to it, you're looking at those neat, at those leaves, you're gonna determine are they needle-like leaves or are they broad leaves? And our needle-like leaves, as Billy said, we only have a few species, I think eight species that are native here to Kentucky, bald cypress being one of them. It has a needle-like leaf. And then everything else has broad leaves. Um, so this would be our things like a, this shellbark hickory um, or our burr oak, that nice big flat broad leaf. So let's talk real quick about our conifers, our needle um, bearing trees or cone bearing trees. So on conifers, our, we have needles in a couple of different arrangements and that helps with the identification. We've got scale-like, those overlapping little scales. Um, think of like on a snake almost, um, but they're a little more pronounced than that. Or we've got single type needles. They're individually um, attached to the twig. And then we have needles that are grouped together in little bundles. And it's like in a little woody cup, it's called a fascicle, um, but the needles will be grouped together in twos up to fives. And we'll look at a few examples here. And these are our species of cone bearing or needle bearing trees here, our conifers here in the state. We have Eastern red cedar, which is our top one here. And it has, as you can see the, not the ones on the very end of the branch, but on the bottom, they are compressed um, scale like needles. And then this is the new growth on the um, tip of the branch. And it'll tend to be more spiky um, as it's first starting to grow, eventually turning into more of a compressed needle. And then we've got our Easter, our Northern white cedar, which we don't have all over the state. It does get planted a lot. It's one of those we plant a lot in cemeteries. Um, and it has very soft foliage. Actually, if you cut a branch and lay it down, it's gonna lay flat the way the sprays are on that. Whereas our Eastern red cedar won't do that. And the Northern white cedar is not gonna have the sharp prickly new growth on it like the Eastern red cedar. So let's look at our individual, our single um, needles. And we have Eastern hemlock. And um, people, I'm sure you know and love this tree and we worry for it greatly with the hemlock woolly adelgid. Um, but it's a really important tree of our cove um, forest ecosystems. And um, its needles are individual and they, uh, there's my little mouse goes. Um, you have, see there's one needle attached to that twig and then another needle attached to that twig. So it's singly attached. And then the same for the bald cypress. You get single needles attached to the twig. Now note on bald cypress, and um, while everything else we're looking at here is an evergreen, when we think of conifers, we think of evergreen, as Billy mentioned, bald cypress is an, ex is an exception to that. It is our deciduous um, conifer in the state. So it doesn't have needles right now. It's just getting ready to grow those needles for the spring. And now we're talking about needles in bundles. And the big one we think about is Eastern white pine. And it has needles in groups of five. So if you think of white, W-H-I-T-E, that's five letters, white pine. So you can go down to the stem on here and look at that little cup and you can pull, count those up without even pulling it off, count those needles and you'd count five. And this is where it's really important that you look at more than one set of fascicles because sometimes a needle can fall out or somebody brush up against it. So look at more than one. So Eastern white pine, five needles. Um, this is a common, obviously we know a common tree in our landscapes. We plant it a lot um, to make screens, but we do find it out in um, our ecosystems as well. And then there's pitch pine. And this is really more of a true forested tree. We would consider this um, more of a lumber bearing tree. And our pitch pine, it has needles in groups of three and they're always in groups of three. And they're about three inches long. And you can see nice three inches long needles and always in groups of three. And that's important because the tree that it also looks very much alike in the woods and they will be in the same location within the woods is the shortleaf pine. And the shortleaf pine has needles in groups of twos and threes. So that's why it's important to make sure you look at multiple sets of these fascicles. So shortleaf in twos and threes, pitch pine only in threes. And then lastly, we've got um, 
our Virginia pine. People also call it scrub pine. This is the one that will grow along our road cuts up in the tops of our ridges. I mean, just the driest, sandiest, least fertile type soils. Um, and its needles are in groups of two. You can see that. And they tend to be short, maybe two inches, maybe shorter, maybe a little bit longer. But a lot of times they're twisted, almost like they're in a little embrace. And um, so those are our, um, and that's Virginia pine. So those are our conifers. So that's eight of the 120 plus species we talked about. And so let's look at some of the broad leaf characteristics that we're going to want to focus on when we are um, learning to identify our trees by their leaves. So we'll talk about leaf arrangement. We're going to look at leaf form. We'll go over what all of these means. Leaf margin. And even the leaf tips um, can be a good characteristic, what the base of the leaf looks like. Um, and I also want to just point out it's important to um, look at the bud especially like this time of year. So this is how you can identify trees um, in the winter when we don't have leaves. You can use a special tool for identification of buds. Um, but knowing where your buds are, you've got a terminal bud. That's the one for shoot elongation. Um, and that's going to be at the tip of the branch. And then you've got your lateral buds. And this is next year's leaf. And that mark below it is the leaf scar from last year's leaf. And these are important in this time of year because it's going to help you determine leaf arrangement if they're arranged alternately or oppositely on that branch. And basically the buds are just the location of the new stems, fruits, and leaves. So we'll look at a few buds here. I love this guy. Um, it looks like a, a moth antenna, dark and feathery on our pawpaw. And here we have a red maple. Those little guys are side by side. This one's great, the duck bill, and this is our a terminal bud on our eastern, I mean, on our yellow poplar. And this great big bud here is from our buckeyes. We've got great big leaves, so it's got a great big bud. Sharp, pointy little buds, and this is on our American beach. And then finally on our oaks, which we have many of them in the state, it tends to have um, its terminal um, buds will be, they'll have multiple buds at the end of the, on the, the branch there. All right, so we're gonna talk about, we talked about if we've got needles or broad leaves. Now let's talk about leaf arrangement. So our leaves can be arranged oppositely as we see here. So those leaves are right across each other on that branch. Think about leaves right across the street. And if you can remember the mnemonic mad buck, you can remember the groups of trees that we have in the state that have oppositely arranged leaves. Those are maples, ashes, dogwoods and buckeyes. Now we have numerous maples, numerous ashes, numerous dogwoods and numerous buckeyes. But if your tree has oppositely arranged leaves and it's a native tree, you're out in the woods, you're gonna have a maple, ash or dogwood or buckeye. And then most of our remaining species are alternate. And this is when those leaves are kind of zigzagged on that branch. So they're not right across, but they are in a zigzag pattern on that branch um, so that gives you that alternate leaf arrangement. We do have one species, the northern catalpa, which has whorled leaves. And so those are whorled all right at the same area around that twig. Um, and we had talked about the northern catalpa um, in one of the questions, but yeah, northern catalpa, whorled leaves. Okay, so let's just look at a few actual pictures. So here we have this um, American beach has, as you can see, our leaves and you can see our buds. They are alter they're zigzagged on that branch so they are alternately arranged and we pop over here to opposite on our maples remember maple ash dogwood buckeye they're oppositely arranged you can see the buds are as well as the leaf stems okay the next thing you look at is leaf form so with leaf form we're going to look at where our bud is located so we've got a couple of different kinds of leaf forms. We have simple, and then we've got compound, and our compound can be broken down into palmately, pinnately, and bipinnately. So to figure out if you've got a simple leaf, you're going to look at the blade that you've got right here, and you're going to go down that leaf stem, and you're going to see if there is a bud at the base. And if there is a bud at the base of that leaf stem, and there's only one blade, you got a simple leaf. And a lot of our trees um, have simple leaves. A lot of um, our maples are simple leaves. Dogwoods are simple leaves, red buds are simple leaves, oaks are simple leaves. So a lot of trees have simple leaves. But now we, we walk up to this guy and we're looking at this and we, 
we look at this leaf here. We think this is the main leaf, but we look at the base and we're not finding a bud. We don't see a bud at the base of any of these. So we continue to move down this larger leaf stem and we find that the bud is down here. So we have our bud down here and we actually have a palmately, so it's shaped like your hand, palmately compound leaf. And these, what we thought were leaves are actually called leaflets. And this, an example of this would be our buckeyes. They have palmately compound leaves. And then the next one, and this is where we find a lot of our compounds, trees um, have pinnately and pinnately is like a feather and um, that pinnately compound. So you'd look at the base of each one of these, what you think is the leaf and you're not finding a bud anywhere. And you keep moving down that stem until you find that the bud's all the way down here. So this whole thing is a leaf that's made up of two, four, six, eight, ten, eleven 10, 11 leaflets. And that's pinnately compound. Think black walnut, think hickories. Those are pinnately compound trees. And then this big guy here, this is a big leaf. There are no buds at the base of these leaflets. There's no buds at what, what we think may be a compound leaf. Instead, our buds all the way down here. And this whole thing is bipinnately or doubly pinnately compound. And an example of this is our Kentucky coffee tree. It has a really big leaf. As you can see, that's a big leaf. So leaf form. So remember, we got leaf type, needle or broad leaf. We got leaf arrangement, alternate or opposite. And then we have leaf form, simple or compound. Okay, so we'll look at a few simple leaves. So we've got, there's our buds. We've got a stem and we've got one blade. So this is a simple leaf. Now here's one that we're looking and we do all along the base of these, what we think are leaves, but that don't find a bud instead, we find our bud all the way down here. And even in this picture, you can see how large that bud is. So those are our buds. So this whole grouping here is a leaf. And this is on our black walnut. Trees that have compound leaves tend to have large buds because obviously this is a very large leaf. Okay, so now we look at the leaf margin and that's just the edge of the leaf. So we can have unlobed or entire leaves. So lobes mean like indentations in on it. And this one up here has no indentations. It doesn't have any prickles or any teeth along the edges. Neither does this magnolia down here. So we would have an entire unlobed leaf. Now, when we look at, and I hope everybody knows, these are our examples of our oaks. And um, we have lobed leaves. Now, not all oaks are lobes, but most of the, our oak trees have lobed leaves. So the lobe is the part that sticks out. You think like your earlobe and the part that the, is the indentation looks like where you stuck your thumb in there. That's called the sinus. And depending on the oak, they'll have deep sinuses or not deep sinuses. They could have lobes that have bristle tips on them, like little hair like tips, or they can be just completely rounded like this. Generally, our red oaks have bristle tipped lobes and our white oaks don't. They have rounded lobes. And then we could have leaves that have serrations. And you know, you think of serrations as think of a serrated knife or something. It can have very fall, very fine serrations, little teeth along the edges of the leaf, or they can have even big broad serrations, kind of like a bread knife, like we would find on the American beach. But we can also have leaves that are lobes, like this red maple, one, two, three lobes, and serrated. So they've got teeth along the edges and they are lobed as well. So there's a lot of different characteristics to look at, but I'm gonna introduce you to a tool that walks you through the, the order of this and explains it as it's going along. But before we do that, let's do a quick review. Conifer or broadleaf, and hopefully everybody says this is a conifer. Opposite or alternate, hopefully everybody gets opposite. Alternate or opposite, zigzagged on there, isn't it? So it's alternate. Simple or compound. Well, you can't see up close here, but you can probably see those sulfur yellow buds all the way down here. So this is a compound leaf. In fact, it's a bitternut hickory. Okay, so compound leaf there. Leap, are our margins lobed or entire? This was an example. So we've got nice rounded lobes with deep sinuses. In fact, it's a white oak, so it's lobed. Um, is this statement true or false? This leaf is lobed, serrated, and compound. Do we see lobes? No, it seems entire. Do we see serrations? No, it looks nice and smooth. Is it compound? There's our bud. Here's our little leaf stem and there's one blade. So it is false. 
All right, is this leaf entire or serrated? Well, we don't see any serrations on that. It looks nice and smooth, so we've got an entire leaf. Okay, which one doesn't fit this sequence? And I hit, sorry, but you all will get that I hit down first. But if we look at A, we've got serrated leaf margins, B, serrated leaf margins, C, entire leaf margins, and then D, serrated leaf margins again. So C does not fit that sequence. And that is an example of a pawpaw leaf. And A and B are examples of our um, American beech. And B is, A and D are beech, and B is a hackberry. Okay, so the process of identifying trees, there's a logical sequence to identify the tree of your interest, and you use a tool that's called a dichotomous key, and you've probably used one of these before. You can use them for all kinds of organisms. We're just using them for tree leaves today. And this is a great dichotomous leaf key and the tree finder. It's about $5 off Amazon. It is pocket sized. It's got about 70 pages in it. So it's not a big giant field guide to carry out in the field with you, which makes it very nice. Um, and um, it's a has many, many, many of our trees that we're going to find east of the Mississippi. And then a few that would have been added like scotch pine and stuff like that. Um, and that's the tool that we'll work through here. I mean, just a few minutes, but this is a great little tool, especially if you're doing some programming with a group, um, because it is inexpensive. But let's walk through a super abbreviated example of a dichotomous key. Um, so this is a really good, um, the way a dichotomous key works. It's die meaning two. So there's going to be two statements or two questions, and you're going to start at A or one or whatever. And you're going to read that statement or that question and see which one is most appropriate for your organism, your specimen that you have. So if we look at our example here, does the tree have needles or does the tree have leaves? Well, we hopefully we are saying this tree has leaves. So we're going to go down to statements B now or questions. Are the leaves opposite or are the leaves alternate? Remember what type of leaf? Leaf arrangement now. And if we've got it circled here, we have hopefully every, everybody sees alternately arranged leaves. So the next one's probably going to be about our leaf form. So it tells us to go down to C and it asks if the leaves are simple or are the leaves compound? Well, this we see, a, can't really see the bud, but we see a stem and one blade. So we've got a simple leaf. So we're going to go down to F and we actually get our answer now that we have, what we have is here is a surface berry with its scientific name as Billy talked about in his section. So like I said, super abbreviated um, key. Right now we're gonna look at um, one that, an actual example and using the tree finder. So on page five in that tree finder, it tells you where to start. It starts out with what type of leaf you have. Is it needle-like or is it, um, broad leaf and hopefully everybody says this is a this is our sample here it is a broad leaf so we're going to go over to page 14 remember what that symbol looks like the lollipop tree um or the stylized tree and it's the top bracket now it's asking us about leaf arrangement do these leaves or buds grow opposite like this see this is what's great about this it reminds you what all of these definitions are or if the leaves or buds grow alternately like this well, I've made some circles for you on here and you can see that these leaves grow alternately. So we're gonna flip over to page 21, taking that little logo, that alternately arranged leaves logo over to the other, to over to page 21. And now that's our middle bracket on page 21. And it asks if the leaves are compound. And um, remember it's the, now the leaf um, form, if it's compound, composed of several leaflets. You can tell leaves from leaflets because there are no buds at the base of a leaflet, or if the leaves are simple and not composed of leaflets. Well, if we look closely, we can see that there's probably, that looks like a bud. We've got a leaf stem and we've got one blade. So we have a simple leaf. So now we're gonna take our simple leaf over to page 28 and it's gonna be the bottom bracket. Now it's asking us something about what that margin, the edge of that leaf looks like. So it says, if the leaf has neither teeth nor lobes, go to the next page, or if the leaf has teeth of any kind or wavy margin or lobes. Well, we have no lobes and no teeth. In fact, this was our example for an entire 
unlobed leaf. So we know we're going to the next page. And so we're looking for that symbol up on the next page, top bracket. Now it's asking us something about leaf tip. And we did mention it when we talked about our oaks with that little bristle tip. It's like a hair at the tip of that leaf. And so it's asking if this leaf is tipped with a single bristle, um, like a needle at the tip of a needle, like you see here, or if it has no bristle at it, its tip. The leaf may be pointed or it may not, but it doesn't have a bristle tip. Well, this one doesn't have a bristle tip. And if we, you actually had this in your hand, you'd see it does not have a bristle tip. So we're going to go to the more, the, the leaf without a bristle tip over on the next page. It's the top bracket. And it asks if the leaf is heart shaped with veins branching from the base, or if the leaf is not heart shaped. Well, let's look close at our leaf. Looks pretty closely heart shaped. We got a nice point here. Maybe it could be a little more rounded up here, but it looks pretty rounded. Now let's look at our veins. It asks us if the veins are branch, branching from the base. Well, it looks like they're all branching from the base of that leaf as they go out to the end of the leaf. So what we have just identified is an, a red bud or an Eastern red bud as we also call it, or Circus canadensis. So that's a really quick and easy way to, uh, to learn to identify trees. Um, also want to point out, also shows you a picture there. So you, you can match it up with the picture that you see there as well. And then there's a picture of our Eastern red bed. It's a beautiful tree, which will start flowering here shortly. It flowers before the leaves come out. And it is one of our trees that is in the, the Fabiaceae family or the legume, the pea family, um, with those uh, flattened pea-like pods with usually numerous flattened seeds in it. So a beautiful little spring tree. But I did want to share a few quick tree ID resources with you all. Um, if you don't have a, a handy tree guide, or a tree dichotomous key, you can use the iNaturalist, which is a free downloadable app for your phone where you simply take a picture of what the organism is, the leaf, and it's gonna query its database and give you maybe 10 different examples that you're gonna try to match up and choose from the one that looks most like yours. And um, so that's an easy tool to use, um, especially when you're just out in the field and you want a quick ID. Um, Virginia Tech Tree ID, they have a great website, um, lots and lots of uh, 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 fact sheets about trees. They also have a great online key. So you take your sample in to the house with you and you do your um, identify your sample based on their pictures. It is a very robust tree ID. It has hundreds and hundreds of species. So it can get a little dense and they do have one for your phone, but because it does have so many species until you're pretty, you're a little more comfortable using a dichotomous key, I'd probably stick with um, our tree finder. Arbor Day does also have a, a, a booklet tree finder that you can purchase. It's about 17 or $18, um, but it's nice. It's a dichotomous key as well. A little bit bigger than pocket guide though. And then we've got some other resources on our website, the UK Forestry and Natural Resources Tree ID videos, where Doug McLaren walks you through everything that we've kind of just gone over, the, what type of leaf, leaf um, arrangement, leaf form, leaf margins, and how you use that in a dichotomous key as little short videos. And then we've also got um, the UK Forestry Natural Resources Extension YouTube channel, and we have the Tree of the Week. And we've done 75 to 80 different trees. And, and this is more, you've identified the tree and you want to know more about it. And um, so got a little short videos, about six to eight minutes long on those videos. And um, that tells you all kinds of information about the trees, including some identification. So yeah, take a, take a look, check those out as well. And then the, um, our horticulture department here at the University of Kentucky has Native Trees of Kentucky, where they've got 80 different trees listed there and um, a fact sheet that goes along with each one of those. So check out some of those resources um, um, as you go out and start identifying trees this spring. Awesome. Well, so thanks. hopefully... Yeah, thank you so much for that. I think, you know, that really will kind of shed a new light on how we identify trees by you doing that. And we did have uh, a couple of questions. Okay, if the terminal bud gets broken off, um, browsed by deer, what so, so um, will the tree regenerate that terminal bud or how does the tree deal with that? Yes, it, it can regenerate that terminal, but it's not, I mean, over browse obviously is bad, but no, it'll be okay. Yeah. In any, were there any, I didn't. 
Nope, we're good. You'd already so, answered the, the P one, so. Yes, on the, yes, so um, Barbara had asked about the, um, all our trees that have pods, which we think of Eastern redbud, we think of black locust, honey locust, which are the curly pods, um, and the big fat chunky pods that we think of on our coffee tree, those are all in the P or the Fabaceae family. We do have a few trees that have pods that look like bean pods. And the one that really comes to mind is um, the Northern Catalpa. And it's got that real long skinny um, bean-like pod. We used to call them cigar trees. And, but it's loaded full of little tiny seeds in there and it's not in the Fabaceae family. So usually it's a legume type pod and it'll have numerous seeds, but not malt, not tons of seed in it. So, but you know, she's on the right track with that question, mm -hmm. right? You know, that's Absolutely. a great way to group trees, you know, yep. see similarities and certainly the fruit is one of the ways that they're right. Because you can actually, there's a several identify Google, you know, trees that have um, pods on them, and then they have pod identification. So if you just found a pod, and maybe you're not really sure what tree it, it was on, you might be able to identify it that way as well. Wonderful. Very cool. Good job, Laurie. Thank, Thank you. Excellent. Really appreciate it. Yeah. Sure. Yeah. So, you know, Laurie, I don't know if you want to stick around. We've got, Renee, we wanted to make one quick announcement. We've got a program that we're partnering um, with some folks with, and I'm going to drop a link in the and the chat function for everybody there. And that'll take you to, and I'll go ahead and share it with you now, our, our departmental page for our Ohio, Ohio River Valley Woodlands and Wildlife Workshop. And this is a program that we've partnered with for, you know, Laurie, Renee, what's it been? 12, 13 years, it feels like, you know, a long time um, with them. And they have, uh, so basically what it is, is we work with Purdue University and Ohio State University, and we bring in regional um, folks that have expertise in forestry, wildlife, natural resources, a wide variety of topics um, to make available to folks from these three states. So this year's program is going to actually be um, in Ohio. So you can get to it from our website. So get to that link there. And then there's a little register button there. And then this will take you directly to where you can register for the program. And we rotate this program again between the states each year. So what we'll ask you to do is register through the Ohio State um, website website if that's going to load up I think hopefully sometimes it takes a bit <laughs> it, it's thinking about it um, so it, it, and eventually you'll get there and you'll say registration button and then finally you'll be able to see an agenda and this will list all of the different programs that are available um, during that workshop so um, we have three concurrent sessions that are going to be going on so you've got your choice between three options um, each and every time we'll also feed you a great meal and you'll be able to connect with a lot of folks that have um uh, answers hopefully to the questions that you have. So we'd encourage you all to think about joining us on March 18th. Again, that's on a Saturday. It's, it is a most of the day event, but I, I think you'll get a lot of great content out of it. You know, Renee and Laura, you all have worked on this program for a long time too. Um, anything else y'all want to kind of chime in with? No, I, I just try to reiterate what Billy says. It's a great opportunity to hit a lot of different topics in in great in a great setting too. It's a wonderful facility that we go to. Usually a fabulous lunch, but you get to meet other people from Ohio and Indiana as well, and share with them, and also learn from some of the extension personnel in Ohio and Indiana as well. It's just a yeah, and it, this year's a great. I mean, I think we have a really good um, uh, a, a good agenda going on. Lots to, lots to do. One thing I would advise to do, though, if you are coming, I would print this agenda out and try to figure out which which ones you want to go to because they are uh, simultaneously. So three programs run at the same time. Um, so you'll need to figure out which ones you want to go to. You could figure it out there, but you might want to kind of have a game plan um, in advance. Yeah. And I guess finally, you know, if you are planning to join us, please register. I think um, March 6th is the early bird and then I think March 10th. So um, you still got a, a couple of weeks, but go ahead and get registered if you're interested in this. It'll save you a few dollars if you register early. <laughs> All right. Good deal. Well, hopefully y'all can join us there at the Ohio Valley um, Woodland and Wildlife Workshop. Definitely. So, you know, we greatly appreciate you all joining us every week. Um, you know, we, we couldn't do this show without you. And so we always have, if you have any uh, topics that you'd like, you can let, actually let us know about that. Yeah, we'd be happy to respond. Yes. And we see many um, times we get some responses that are 
a little odd or different. We try to figure those out and we might address it. So next time you're out in your woods, you see something cool or unique or something you don't know what it is, take a picture, let, send it to us. Um, send it on that survey from the woodstoday.com. We have a little link there and you can let us know. Yeah. And I will add if there's a tree of the week that I haven't done that because I'm kind of it's getting thin now. So if you're like, I want to see this tree, put that on there, too, so that that will be my next. Yeah, you hey, you'll answer to the people. I love it. <laughs> there you go. Love it. Yeah. And speaking of that, you know, next week we are going to have an episode on maple. Uh, maple syrup. Hey, you know, have a wonderful video of an event you all had already, and so um, we will. De- we'll be talking about all things maple next week. Yeah, I'm really looking forward to that segment. You know, we've been working with the Kentucky Maple Syrup Project here for a few years, and um, you're going to be able to see some of the many producers that were opening up their operations this um, this winter, and, um, and we had a great turnout. I think for now this year we had more than 2,000 visitors um, attend um, some of these uh, across the state. So um, we put the Together, or I say we, um, our good friends over at AgCom filmed it along with Brianna Fortunato, and they're working to put together a nice video for us um, to kind of highlight really some of the cool scenes. So I'm lo- looking forward to next week. Definitely. So speaking of next week, we are done for today. We will see you next week. Thank you for joining us. Take care. Bye, Bye. everyone. Love the woods today.